Welcome back to another episode of the Real World Assets Show. Today, we have special guest Cole Snell, CEO and founder of Infinio, and Dr. Robert Murphy, the chief economist at Infinio. So today, we're, we're going to talk quite a bit about digitizing the three trillion legacy life insurance industry and on the Providence blockchain, a purpose-built blockchain that's specifically for financial assets. And Infinio is doing this in a lot of different ways, not just revolutionizing the blockchain, but also using AI on their platform to do several things that we'll get into during this, this talk. So welcome, Cole. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. Thanks for having us. Great. So I know we, we chat, I met, I met you, Cole, uh, in Miami, and we've had a few chats about what you're up to and, you know, really exciting stuff. So I know this dates back to 2021. This is not your, uh, either one of your guys' first rodeo in this space. Uh, so it's an exciting event, but I know we're going to talk about your first uh, life insurance policy that was tokenized uh, just as of June 1st. Uh, we're going to get into that, but why don't we just start with kind of the origin story, you know, obviously, uh, kind of typical podcast format, like how'd this start and uh, what was the, the idea and the, the, the moment that, that this took off? Yeah, for me, it was, um, I'll give you a, a kind of a brief founder story. And, um, but, and by the way, it's just, it's super cool that there's an actual RWA podcast now. I think that's just great job, Travis, for standing this up and, you know, drawing awareness. We all know that Thank you. RWA is early still and you know it's great that you're creating a community and an environment for people like us to collaborate with other people because um to you know to move this forward it's really about collaboration and it's not about competition these are two c words in uh any industry that have to be very well timed there's a time to collaborate and there's a time to compete and I tell you the people in rwa that can collaborate are the people that are going to get to the prize they're going to become billionaires sooner than anyone else looking at looking at it as competition. So thanks for uh, thanks for creating an environment for us to, uh, to collaborate with um, other people. Um, origin story was uh, a career in healthcare and then a career in food and now a career in finance. The healthcare career led to the food. It was like, well, to be healthy, exercise, eat well. The exercise piece was tangible. Go for a walk buy a pair of shoes, pretty easy to do, kind of easy to afford. Food was a conundrum, can't find it, can't afford it, don't like the taste of it, don't know how to cook it, don't know where to buy it. And then, you know, solve that, had an exit in healthcare, had an exit in food. And then it was, you know, my sales team in food coming to me saying, you know, we got a problem. I go, what? Are, is our food not delicious or nutritious? And they said, no, it's nutritious and delicious. It's just people can't afford it. And I go, oh, so... I used to think food was the lowest common denominator. If you don't eat, you die. And I realized, yeah, sure, if you don't eat, eventually you'll die. But if you don't have money, you can't buy food. So really, you know, what mattered more? And that's kind of where I sold the food business and moved into the financial industry. And that's where I met Bob, Dr. Murphy, is because um, my financial advisor at the time said, you know, you got, Cole, you got a problem, you've got, you know, cash in a checking account in a bank and here's why that's an issue and i go well, where do i put it and he said life insurance i went what he goes yeah go read this guy's books and it was bob's book he's my financial advisor said go read bob's books and he'll teach you about austrian economics and um, how to control your capital and then it was meeting bob and then learning from him and then getting into crypto and you know leveraging life insurance and staking crypto and i'm realizing you know one of these things is like 150 years old and one of them is like at the time like seven or eight years old and i'm going this is the exact same thing it's just totally different so what would happen if you put it together and well that was infinio so bob you want to maybe share That's how uh, yeah sure yeah so for my end of things um you know i'm an academic economist i thought i was just going to be a college professor teaching economics for my career I uh, got disillusioned with academia, went in the financial sector, and then at some point somebody introduced me to this concept. Of, you know, it, it was called infinite banking. People may have heard different terms for it, but yeah, it's using permanent life insurance as a cash management vehicle. And I, at first, I didn't, didn't make sense to me. I studied it more. Oh yeah, this does make sense. And so I helped co-develop a training program to train financial professionals into how to properly structure these policies, and also like to explain. This is the way you should talk about it to your clients, so it's com you're compliant, but also 
you know, they understand how the thing works, you know. So that's what we did. Cole was one of the graduates of that program. So then when he found Finio, he reached out to me. And also, on the side, I had also done work on the economics of Bitcoin. And so Cole said, Bob, you know, what, we're, what I'm doing with this company, Infineo, is we're taking whole life insurance and putting it on the blockchain. And since you know the economics of both of those areas, you know, you got to be involved. And <laughs> yeah, I met the team, was blown away by all the, the people he'd recruited already and said, yep, I got to be part of this. So that's, that's how it, it started. And, you know, just the, the benefits of doing, using whole life policies the way that we had discovered, there were frictions involved that by putting it, by tokenizing it, you know, uh, putting it on the blockchain just opens it up to everybody on planet Earth with an internet connection. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I've, I've interfaced with multiple uh, of your team members and, uh, you know, definitely you have uh, put together a who's who of of uh, what's going to work and what's going to succeed. So, you know, definitely commend you guys on that for sure. And I, that's one of the big things is having, uh, you know, not first-time founders, having academics having, you know, the right, right legal structure, picking the right technology and blockchain, like with provenance, where there's already been a success with other brands like figure and, and other key lock loans and stuff. So this is, you're not blazing trails that haven't already been blazed. You know, yeah, you're first and you're new, but I do like that. It's a very calculated aspect, you know, wouldn't be surprising, of course, because we're talking about whole life. And I think it's important that we kind of just back up and talk a little bit about, you know, why whole life, like not everybody understands life insurance or how important, like what kind of cash management vehicle permanent life insurance is and can be. So why don't we just talk a little bit about that and, you know, give some insightful aspects of what this is all about. I'll tell a, a kind of a personal story and then I'll let the smart guy talk about the economic side of it. Um, the peace of mind, I own 14 whole life insurance policies personally, and the peace of mind that I have owning these policies as an entrepreneur, um, as a father, as a, as a spouse, as a, as a business partner, I feel very responsible. Um, I feel I sleep really well at night knowing that if uh, I fail as a spouse, as a father, <laughs> as a business partner, uh, something has my back and something has my, uh, my, my counterparty's back, you know, a, as well. I feel very de-risked, let's put it that way. And it's not just because of the you know, the death benefit that's tied to it, or if I get hit by a bus and a bunch of people become millionaires, that's, that's wonderful. Um, it's just, be, it's because of the, uh, the control that I have over my capital, the capital, my, the capital that I have in my life today, the money, the cash that I have in my life today. Um, my capital lives inside of life insurance policies. I leverage it out of the life insurance policies to make private equity investments, to buy my Starbucks, pay my cell phone bill, you know, it, how you do, it's kind of, I can get into the specifics, you know, sometime as to, you know, how that all looks. There's some logistics that have to occur, but it's, you know, it's definitely possible. So, yeah, I think for me, the answer to the question is, is peace of mind. And, and I, that's something that I know Bob and I wanted to share with the world is using blockchain primarily and AI. The blockchain is the, is the key piece of it that makes it happen. The, the AI is just the thing that kind of moves it along kind of exponentially, but the blockchain is the foundation of by which the democratization of these feelings that I'm describing, you know, can exist for people all around the world. And then maybe Bob can weigh in more kind of economically on that. Yeah, sure. Just to give more of the nuts and bolts of like, how is it possible what Cole's talking about? So just real basic in case some of your listeners don't know. So your term policy is what people mostly think of as life insurance that, oh yeah, you you got a million dollar death benefit for 30 years. I keep paying my premium payment. If I happen to die in that span, the payment goes to the beneficiary. But if I outlive that, the policy expires and I walk away. Whereas a, a whole life policy, it's, it's for your whole life. And so, you know, as long as you keep making your premium payments, it's always going to be in force. And so the, the beneficiary is getting paid at some point. You just don't know when. And, and so part of the, the deal with that is with each payment you're making in just the passage of time, there's what's called a cash surrender value that keeps marching upward and it can't go down. And so that's if you happen to turn the policy and they give you a spot payment, that's like a, a discount relative to the face death benefit. And another interesting feature with these policies that's built in contractually is the carrier will make loans to you with that underlying cash surrender value as the collateral at a, you know, at a specified interest rate contractually. 
and it's a, an attractive rate because from the carrier's point of view, that loan is the safest thing imaginable. Like you can't default on it because they themselves are the ones who have guaranteed the collateral. They, they just don't know yeah. when they're getting it. If you die, then they pay themselves back before they pay the death benefit. Or if you surrender, they pay themselves back before they give you the, the net cash surrender, right? So that's why it's real safe and the, the interest rate's attractive. They don't run credit checks or anything because they don't care. They know they're getting paid back, right? So because of that, um, it's a very flexible, robust cash management vehicle while you're alive, in addition to having you know the death benefit for your, for your uh, heirs and so forth. So that's the idea. There's also tax advantages that we don't need to get into, but structured properly, if you're working with an advisor who knows how to do it right, these things are pretty nifty little devices or big ones too. And yep. that, that was the idea, but there is a lot of friction. It's to get a life insurance policy, you got to pee in a cup or whatever. You know, it's, there's a lot involved. It's not just like going out and buying bonds. And so, and it's hard to get in and out of them too, right? It's a, it's a cumbersome thing. Eventually they yield in the high fours or even low five percentage points in terms of annual rates of return on the cash value relative to the premium payment. But you got to hold it for a while to get into that sweet spot, right? So there's a the kind of thing, if you do the long game and you know how to use these things, they're very convenient. And for the relatively low risk of losing money on it, the rate of return is quite attractive. Like they have a high sharp ratio, if you want to think of it like that. But again, it's right now a money manager couldn't say, oh yeah, give me $2 million of that. You know what I mean? What are you talking about? You got to go take out policies for, on new people or what do you mean? So that's where Infinio comes in now to be able to, we've come up with ways to be able to say to the institutional investor, yeah, you want $2 million of exposure to this asset class? We can do that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like Cole and I talked about in Miami, I mean, it's just the cash value component and the way that whole life works, it's made for blockchain. It's, it's made for this, this process. And what, what I also like, aside from you guys bringing seniority and academia to this and tech, is that you also did have a life insurance agency. We'll touch on that real quick. Um, I say had, because I know that that, that changed and, and that kind of sunsetted. So I know we, we talked about kind of bringing this up because not only do you understand all these aspects, but you also ran a life insurance agency where you're selling and, and originating new policies. So maybe just give us a little bit of backstory there on, on what was going on. It's an interesting, yeah. And thanks for bringing that up because if you really think about what it is that we're doing here, and we think about RWA, you think about real world assets. It's like, I find that so many people in our industry are putting the cart before the horse. Like they're, they're creating the, the, the technology stack and they're creating the, the technological solution to the real world asset before they're understanding or owning the uh, operating the real world asset. So we wanted, you know, we don't need to go fast right now. Th this is the thing about this industry is that there's no pressure to go fast. There's actually pressure to go slow. It's easy to go fast. Um, it's, and, and it's very expensive to go fast. Um, it's more responsible to go slow. So to go slow for us meaning means we can be a tech company that it's still kind of like keep your friends close and your enemies closer. We can be a tech company that still owns an analog business so that we can uh, disintermediate or add efficiencies using technology to, um, you know, the thing, because we know it, we understand it. We understand where technology can very specifically add efficiencies and where it cannot, because, you know, the, like, it's like the question that I love the question. And it's the question that when I first got into blockchain, that people, what, fortunately I had some great advisors around me. This was years ago. And I had ideas around blockchain and they would say, you don't need blockchain for that. Or they would ask the rhetorical question, say, do you need blockchain for that? And I thought at the time, this is six, seven years ago, you needed blockchain for everything. Well, it, you don't. And to own the agency for us was really understanding the life insurance industry, you know, at its, at its core um, foundational level to understand where and where we cannot apply uh, technology, blockchain primarily to add efficiencies. So it was, it was a very uh, eye-opening experience. I would say, fortunately, today we do not own it. We've sunsetted it. We've we've learned from it, and uh, we're better for it. I would say. <laughs> yeah, now you you were telling me a bit about your part of, like you said, AI is a component. It's kind of under the under the cover type of components. I mean, like you said, most of this is is really blockchain tech. But you do have uh, 
a fairly sophisticated LLM AI, I believe at this point with, with, uh, it can obviously work in that capacity to help educate people that are looking to onboard their policies, et cetera, and learn about whole life. Yeah. So we have actual Dr. Murphy, not AI bots. We have AI Bob <laughs> and, and for your listeners and viewers with the avatar that we stood up that we're very proud of is really proprietary. And I would just put it, call it, say that, you know, the most investable aspect of artificial intelligence is, and any AI tech VC will tell you that it's proprietary AI. So the, the question is, is that, well, if we're, we're, we don't raise money for AI, we primarily raise money for uh, blockchain, AI, everyone should be doing AI. I mean, all companies should be in some degree AI. It's just that our AI happens to be really investable and really propri proprietary because it's actually the, the avatar of Dr. Robert Murphy. And like our AI is so good, you wouldn't know if this was actually Bob or AI Bob. Right. And yeah, so I don't, why don't I let analog Bob win? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so thanks, Cole. Um, you're, you're right, Trev. So it's ultimately, I mean, we, we have different uses for him in the for all of our products that yes, like when, if the public goes to our website that they can click on something instead of just having like a chat window to help them or whatever, like, yes, you've got AI Bob there and he can make videos and things like that. And so, yes, he, it's a large language model that we've now just migrated to we, before it was like a, a GPT four thing, but now we've built our own internal model, you know, running on our servers. And so that's, that's a migration they recently made, but yeah, but it's trained. So it's got the capabilities of a GPT-4 in terms of just, you know, understanding English and knowing about the world and, you know, been trained on the internet. But then we've also given a lot much more uh, company-specific information, training it on my writings and some of my speeches and things like that. So that that's what it it is, that it, it knows intimately all of our products and just the kind of the economics involved with why what we're doing makes sense and just to guide customers or investors or whoever through the process. But it's, it is, it did kind of, when Cole first recruited me, he didn't say, I'm putting whole life and putting it on the blockchain and we're going to use AI. That wasn't part of the conversation. It's just <laughs> our company is a tech company and our people are so into, you know, the, the new things that once we realized, oh, AI is going to revolutionize every industry, the, you know, and we want to be on the forefront, it, our people quickly, you know, enveloped it and we rolled it into what we were doing. Yeah, that's exciting. So let's, let's dive into these different uh, buckets of what this really solves with the blockchain. So, you know, going back to that, I know one thing I'll kick it off with, I know just a very practical one is 7.4 billion in life insurance benefits remain unclaimed still. And I know you guys have like an acronym for this, like limbo or maybe an industry acronym that's called limbo, you know, where these policies are in limbo. So maybe let's talk about just Several things. Obviously, there's just quite a few things where you're going to democratize access and cost savings, et cetera. But even just a very practical thing that exists right now is something that, that this will be tackling, apparently, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's amazing to think that there's over $7 billion of stranded death benefit out there that is really should be in the pockets and the bank accounts of the beneficiaries of the smart people who spent a lot of time and money and put a lot of um, emotion into standing up these life insurance policies and they're not, they're not getting paid out because simply for the most part, because the life insurance company can't find the beneficiary and the beneficiary didn't know they were the, the beneficiary of, of these, of, of this money. And so it's a good, basic, simple use case for blockchain. And the first product that we wanted to launch, we wanted it to be relatable. We wanted it to be emotional. We wanted it to be free. So this is, a, this is free. We don't charge for this. So, you know, anybody with a life insurance policy can go to our policy ledger, just like you would send a file attachment uh, to a friend via email. You can upload your life insurance policy to our policy ledger. And once your life insurance policy is held on the blockchain, the question is, well, where is the best place to hold your policy? Should it be digitalized or should it be in, uh, in paper format in a drawer or even worse? you know, in your inbox and in your server or on your hard drive somewhere, you know, what, what, what are the likelihood that the beneficiary is going to uh, receive the check if it's the policy stuck in a drawer or stuck on your hard drive? Well, if you hold your policy on the blockchain, the, the idea is, is that there's basic, simple web two CRM integrations that when the life insured graduates from this earth dies, 
the policy instantly is then emailed uh, to the beneficiary and instructions as to who to call to go get a check. And so, you know, we're just very proud. There's a bunch of other functionality that's kind of baked into that, but we believe that the future, very simply put, is that people will hold their life insurance policies in a digital form versus a paper form to just to make sure that, you know, the value is uh, shared. Yeah. I mean, blockchain is a digital ledger and what, what not, you know, it's a better place to, to store it, like you mentioned. And as you mentioned with, with, you know, some type of uh, intermediary email system, you can obviously notify people right away if, if something happens. So, yeah. Right. And, and even f beyond just the, the worst case scenario where they just can't locate the beneficiary or like close the beneficiary just didn't even know because sometimes people don't tell the beneficiaries for various reasons about that. And it's a, it's a surprise when, oh, <laughs> Uncle Jim died and he left me 200 grand. Um, but beyond that is even for people who do know that, oh, yeah, dad had a life insurance policy. But when when somebody dies and you're going to the funeral, you don't want to, in addition to planning the funeral, be hunting around. And where, where did he say that? What, which carrier was it? And you call him the carrier and what, you know what I mean? Like, so this, even if it's somebody who ultimately would have been paid, we're just saving them a lot of hassle. So that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. it really makes sense. So even for people who think, oh, no, I told my kids about the, the policy. They know about it. Still, you, you're, you know, if you're going, like Cole said, you're going to all the trouble and you're being responsible and farsighted enough to have a life insurance policy you've been funding for decades, you can also then spare your designated beneficiaries the hassle of fumbling around looking for the policy number when you go, this is boom, they get, you know, emailed or a text message or whatever parameters you set up. Yeah. Well, not only is this just a super practical use case, but I'm just a, uh, a geek about on ramps, you know, and I think this is like just such a natural, smooth on ramp into the Infinio world. And the kind of value that you that, that you and the team are providing, because, you know, a lot of times it's like somebody kind of hears about something and then there's like this real clunky, you know, maybe seems difficult way to get started. But, it, you know, just being able to come in, get your get your policy on on chain is a, like you mentioned, it's a very easy process and it's just a way to get started. It doesn't cost you anything. And it's a way to learn more about a video and, and get started from there. Yeah, like all, all the wallets are abstracted out. There's no Web3 interface for the end user. It, it's, it's You could upload a policy and hold it digitally just as easy as you could send a file attachment. So it doesn't, you know, there's not, it's not intimidating. And this isn't really something unique for Infinio. This is how most modern Web3 user interfaces are designed today is a, with wallet abstraction. So you're not having to set up MetaMask or, you know, various things like that. Um, yeah. That's an example, but I think it's important to know that behind the, uh, the policy ledger, there is, there's really kind of a method to our madness and, you know, why it is that we're creating this. And I appreciate you saying that, Travis, that there's a kind of a very fluid point of value and a very easy on-ramp uh, for people. And we're offering this free feature. I mean, there's a method to our madness is when, once people are engaged into the policy ledger, what we're able to do is then also go back to them with additional features. So one of the the biggest things and probably one of the most important things that blockchain solves for life insurance and why we believe the best use case for blockchain is in fact life insurance we've done a lot of work we've done a lot of math and a lot of economics you know on why we believe this uh, we can back it up we've got lots of white papers mostly dr murphy's written most of these papers and, and the, the extended team the advantages of putting your your, your policy on the policy ledger really are seen um, through the ability to trade your policy in a secondary market if need be. So now that you've had your policy up on chain already, you can just through the click of a button, decide whether you want to sell your policy. For whatever reason, you may want to sell it for no different reason than you may want to sell a home or a piece of jewelry or uh, another investment. It may be time to liquidate it. Pol life insurance policies have been deemed as personal property since 1911. And uh, if you can imagine, globally, there's a $3 trillion industry without a secondary market. There's no industry in the world that big without a secondary market. And the life insurance industry virtually has no secondary market. I mean, technically it does, but it's very obscure and fairly misunderstood. 
uh, which it's called life settlements or viaticals, but that is not what we do. We do we are not involved in life settlements or viaticals, uh, but we are interested in taking the average person who's 40 that has a life insurance policy that for whatever reason doesn't want it anymore, can't afford it anymore, uh, and wants to trade it. Once you're in the system, you can now find a buyer for that policy and uh, create a market. So we're very, we're very excited about that. And you can't do that without blockchain. That's the thing is that people have tried, even in 2017, there was a company that tried to do that uh, using blockchain and the tokenomics and the thinking just wasn't really there yet. It is today. People have tried to do it in the analog. The friction, the administrative friction is so heavy that it scrapes out all the profit. So yeah, we're left today with an opportunity to put blockchain to work to create a secondary market for a $3 trillion industry. And I would say, as mentioned before, an industry that represents, in my opinion, without argument, the most important asset in the world. I mean, I think that life insurance, you talk to any sophisticated financial advisor and they'll tell you life insurance is the most important asset in the world and not just because of the death benefit. That's a component of it. Yeah, that's yeah incredible. Just, to, just to follow up on that. Um... Right, because as Cole is saying right now, yes, without blockchain, somebody could, if they wanted to, sell their policy to somebody else in the United States. You know, there's a right legal and regulatory framework for that. But it's a cumbersome thing. There's certain licenses that need to be involved and whatever. So it it is difficult to to do that. And so what we're saying is, strictly speaking, under the hood, that yes, somebody, you know, transfers the analog. So at the carrier level, you know, the, there's just one tr change that's made. And then once the thing is digitized and we have it, you know, an SPV or whatever, and now there's a token pointing to it. And, and all the, like Cole said, there, before there just wasn't the regulatory and legal apparatus, but now there are to, for these things. And then now that token, you can just trade, you know, trade hands. And that's, that's much easier. And, you know, that's all above board because now it's, you know, a different and a re, uh, third tertiary market. Right. So th the point just being that it's, there's things that there's a reason in the analog world, there wasn't a robust secondary market, even though these things are, you know, have tons of economic value. And now we're just really opening that up to everybody. Yeah. I mean, that, that it, it is massive, especially with a $3 trillion industry to not really have a secondary market other than maybe calling your agent and seeing if they can make a few phone calls for you and a few other things like, you know, that's really not been fluid. And as you mentioned, the blockchain is what changes that because it adds that transparency and allows that, uh, tokenized economy to, to transfer the asset right off, right away. So no, it's exciting. So um, we talked about some of the costs, like maybe, maybe we want to touch a little bit more on the cost savings and efficiencies of what you're doing as well. Cause I, you know, we touched on that a little bit, but I, I think it's not as sexy, but it, we all agree. I know that some of the, the boring stuff is the sexiest <laughs> in tokenization right now. So I think talking a little bit about the, use of smart contracts and, and reducing the need for intermediaries, toll takers, and all that stuff. I think it's really important to point this out because life insurance is no different than some of the other things like home equity lines and other things that are being use cases that are working right now. Right. So I, I think if I understand the question properly, it, it would be drawing on some similarities to what figure has done. I mean, just to kind of figure have done a absolutely amazing job using blockchain to offer a more efficient HELOC or second position mortgage. Uh, it, they, they offer it faster, it's better, the underwriting is potentially uh, smoother um, and potentially more cost effective. So they've done this essentially by leveraging language and uniform commercial codes to uh, account for what would be an e-lien or an e-note you know, on, uh, on, as collateral. So. What is this, the cost savings there that either they can pass along or keep for themselves? I mean, it's it's basis points, but with at volume, it really, really matters. It does. Um, yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, I'm I don't obviously work at Figure. I'm a fan of what they do. Um, we work on the same blockchain uh, that they do, so I'm not. You know, what I'm saying is probably to some degree accurate. I might be kind of screwing it up to some degree, but you could. You can take life insurance and remove, excuse me, you can take mortgages in the case of figure and remove that and implement life insurance. So 
life insurance is, uh, is collateral. And so if someone wants to collateralize their life insurance policy, the same uniform commercial codes, that figure is leveraging and the language in those uniform commercial codes for issuing liens and you know notes against collateral can be still used. So what is the cost savings uh, to a, you know, a life insurance borrower uh, or a lender, depending on, you know, what side of the, uh, the trade that you're on, it's probably 150 basis points or so, uh, and a massive amount of time. If it would take a month or two months to, you know, issue the money, uh, tied to the collateralization with blockchain, it could be hours or days. So I would say that the time is arguably more valuable than the money. Yeah. It, it, just to give it a, a more concrete example too, of the kind of thing Cole's talking about, just to make sure your listeners are getting it, Travis, that like right now, let's t say we took somebody and, and as, as Cole said, there, there's a group, like Cole said, he owns 14 of these policies. Okay. I don't uh, own that many. I didn't have the exit from the food industry that he did, but I would have that many policies if I did. Right. So there's uh, successful people, Canadians and Americans that, they have lots of these policies and they've got each one has a certain, you know, limit into it and, and they have money coming and going. But like, I know guys, they have to have Excel spreadsheets keeping track of, oh yeah. And then I got to make my, my uh, interest payment on this policy. And then I got to do this. Oh, and I'm, I borrowed money from this one. And they, they have a whole thing keeping track of, cause it's, you know, and they got to call or, you know, either do it online or pick up the phone for each carrier where these policies have been issued from. And that's the way they have the money coming and going. So among other things, just to give one concrete example, if this person were to tokenize all of those 14 policies with us and then work with our third party lenders who understand the nature of the collateral. So they're borrowing against their policies, not by going to the individual carrier, which is what the conventional way is right now that you would do, but instead through our network, then, you know, it's all handled with smart contracts and whatnot. So you can't borrow more than what your cash value is, that sort of thing. You know, to them, it's just one big pool. Like they don't have to worry underneath the hood about calling you, you know, because the carriers aren't even involved. The carrier doesn't even, you know, the carrier just thinks it's the SPV that owns it. So I'm just giving one example there, the kind of thing I mean. And then, yeah, you get a better interest rate if, if it's all of planet Earth as the potential lender, as opposed to what does my contract say with that one particular carrier that I bought this policy from 30 years ago, right? So yeah. all those reasons go into why, if you understand how this works, in the analog world, yeah, this just, you know, supercharges it. Yeah, I think that's a perfect transition into your first policy you guys tokenized uh, just as of this podcast uh, less than a week ago. So uh, why don't we talk a little bit about that and just kind of what this means for, you know, the life back securities and, and how this, uh, the next steps for Infinio. The coolest thing about tokenizing that policy was that it was done. Our CTO, Zuhair, did it while on an Emirates flight between Houston and Dubai. <laughs> so it was, it was actually done over the Atlantic at, I don't know, 40,000 feet or something like that. So yeah, that, that's another example of, uh, of technology. And yeah, it's, a, it's cool. So we actually have the, our CFO actually was able to take a, like a GPS locator of the plane and stamp where he was across the Atlantic when this, like it's, we're really geeking out on this accomplishment and, and capturing it. So, yeah, I mean, we, uh, we, it took us a year and a half of kind of planning and uh, strategizing. And yeah, last Saturday, we uh, minted the world's first mainnet. We had done on testnet. We had done a couple policies on testnet, but mainnet uh, digital life insurance policy on the Providence blockchain, uh, tokenized life insurance policy on the, uh, it's basically we created a, an NFT out of a life insurance policy. So, and we have, uh, we have, uh, we're, and we're minting every day. Now it's now that we've uh, opened those floodgates, we're bringing more and more value to the Providence blockchain and, and value we think to the life insurance industry. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And I, and I know one thing that's somewhat unique to Provenance is the, the aspects of real, real time asset values, which allow you, as, as you mentioned in your use case already to be able to take loans without even contacting the carrier based on using blockchain technology and being able to, to, to know what that, that, you know, their death benefit or their um, cash value is, I should say real time. Right. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah. You'd still have to contact the carrier. I mean, there, there would still be, if you're, if you're taking loans on the policy, there still has to be a lien 
issued, uh, and the the carrier would have to you know acknowledge that lien. So, there, I mean, we have to be careful about people wanting the blockchain to be more than it actually is. So it right. it can do some of the stuff, but it can't do all of the stuff. Right. Just to clarify, too, like. Yeah, Cole is saying just to, that right now, if somebody uploads their policy, that yeah, that there we haven't. Infinio has not acquired legal ownership of the policy. Right, right. So that, but yeah, so the stuff what I was saying about the blood barring that that's more down the road. That yeah, eventually when okay. it gets to the page, yes, where somebody if they do transfer legal ownership and then they have the token that's the legal claim, then yeah, you could borrow and lend against that in, directly without going through the carrier. But, okay. but yeah, right now for what we have up. Technically, yeah, the, the, we don't we don't legally own their policy, so the carrier would still have to be involved. Yeah, and I and I just want to point out when we're starting to have this conversation, it, it's very important that we point out to people that, and anyone listening to this, or if it's someone from the life insurance industry or the crypto industry, that like at no point in time are are these policies when they're minted onto a blockchain or turned into NFTs, are they like I'm just going to make this really blunt, turned into cryptocurrencies or you know, liquidated in some turned into like Dogecoin or some meme token or traded in some black market somewhere. This is like not how it works. People that don't know what it is that we're doing here or talking, and it's likely someone from the life insurance industry because like I've never met a group of people who uh, just are, you know, really hard nosed about an analog and antiquated you know, business and like, we love them, but we're here to help them in a lot of ways. So if there's anyone from the life insurance industry listening to this, trust me that these life insurance policies are safer on the blockchain than they are in a drawer or, I mean, I'll give you an example. We, we, we work very, very closely with uh, the life insurance uh, commission in the Bahamas, for example, we know them very well. They've been very supportive of what we're we're doing. We work with, with various life insurance carriers and executives, you know, in the in the Bahamas. And a real world concern for life insurance regulators in the Bahamas are um, hurricanes. And there was uh, there were a few instances of outer islands in the Bahamas being hit by hurricanes and paper life insurance policies being lost. And the the and literally the. Life Insurance Commission, these are a very group of very, very sophisticated, very progressive people who see the merits of telling the citizens of the Bahamas and the carriers to hold their life insurance policies digitally on the blockchain so that they don't get lost in a, in a hurricane. I mean, these are like real world problems and issues that we're hearing back literally from the horse's mouth, from the regulators themselves, right? So that's that, that would be a reason as to why you would hold your a, a very pragmatic reason as to why you would digitalize your life insurance policy so that it doesn't get lost in a hurricane. I mean, it's just so simple, but hard hard for us to kind of think about. Yeah, that's well said. So I think the uh, the next steps. What what does it look like? You know, now that we the floodgates open, what, what's uh, Paint a picture for me for uh, what taking what over things... the world, Travis. Yes. Uh, what does it look like? It looks like uh, I'll, I'll be very specific about this. Uh, we know exactly what it looks like. Um, we have a very clear roadmap. We will be uh, digitalizing massive amounts of life insurance policies, uh, acquiring massive amounts of life insurance policies, uh, using them as fixed income alternatives. They have very high sharp ratios. Uh, we're going to be putting them into an SPV, again, digitalizing them and using that as a foundation uh, to offer uh, additional digital products on top of it. So call it a call it a hedge for additional uh, products. Likely it'll look like a the first product we launch will likely be a retirement product, a digital retirement product that um, has some amazing economic benefits built into it. So if you think about life, digital life insurance on the bottom, and then a retirement product stacked on top of it, as and then that will be the the source of, of distribution. But digitalizing life insurance policies really is just about democratization. It's about allowing people in emerging markets uh, to appreciate, you know, and enjoy these assets, 
It's about you know exposure to yield, to guaranteed yield even in a lot of cases. Um, the life insurance industry does in fact use the word guarantee. Very yeah. few uh, financial industries uh, use the word. It's a very controversial word, um, but there are guarantees you know, b- baked in as much as you can guarantee something. Um, it's baked into the life insurance industry and we're going to leverage that and, uh, allow people, uh, especially in emerging markets to, you know, enjoy, um, the, uh, the, 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 the ownership of these policies. And, and these yeah. Just, just to amplify that, Travis, uh, what Cole was saying, I mean, yeah, the, the bare bones, what are we doing? We're tokenizing life insurance. Okay. And that provides benefits. Like we said for the, you know, the original policy holder. But then we were just realizing once you do that and now you have the accessibility and the, you know, it's the analogy I've been using the last couple of days around the office was it's like we just invented Legos and we had the mind that, oh, what if we had a thing where we just could build a house that little kids could play with? And so we, you know, ship the box and we show this is how you take the Legos and you build a house. But then we're like, wait a minute, this is a whole lot bigger than just the house. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of stuff. So the same kind of thing here is once we do now open up to this asset class, which really, even though everyone's known it existed, but it just has been too cumbersome to really, you know, it's not, it's not really easy to get in and out of and that sort of thing. Now that this thing really is versatile and mobile because of us tokenizing it, there's all kinds of structured products you can create with it, with these underlying building blocks. Right. And some of the structured products will be institutional grade type products, I'm guessing that, so there's going to be two components to your, your user base at some point. Yeah, do you call? Do you want to answer that one? Well, yeah. No, no, Bob, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, exa- exactly, Travis. Right. We th- think. I mean, it's a whole spectrum from individual household up through like you know medium sized business owner all the way up to yes, huge portfolio managers. As Cole said, among other things, you get a pool of these whole life policies with certain characteristics, you know, and we can calibrate them and get you know ones that are people that are, that are younger. And so that the rate of return on the cash value is higher, but then people who are older, the rate of return on the cash is as high, but now they're more likely to die. So, you know, we, we have a, a pricing modules and so forth. And you get a pool of this stuff and that thing has a very high sharp ratio. And then, yeah, you just pass yeah. that along to fixed income investors. If they can understand it, if they can, if they're, they're allowed to own digital assets, we say this is a fixed income alternative. Among other things, there's no interest rate risk, right? Because these policies, the cash value keeps marching up. If interest rates shoot up, they don't go down in value, unlike bonds. So right. in that sense, these things are safer than treasuries, at least vis-a-vis interest rate risk. So there's, there's a lot of interesting properties once you have a way to get your hands on this thing easily, and that's what tokenization allows. 100%, yeah. I mean, this isn't very, as you mentioned, this isn't very far up the risk curve. Uh, you know, it, it is like kind of lockstep with treasuries. You know, obviously there's a big appetite for even mortgages that are backed and, and packaged. And I would argue very clearly, like this is even you know, more safe, you know, from that. And, you know, there's not financial products that are easily accessible at this point for whole life. So, yeah, I think that that's a really interesting dynamic that will unfold as you continue to grow the network. I'll tell you what the most interesting thing about it, I think, is, is if you're looking at life insurance as a way to measure, leverage, liquidate, or evaluate something, right? You put money into an idea, it, it's, it's underwritten by a human life, medically and financially, and it spits out uh, some economic value to it. So really, what is life insurance, really? It's a way to, it's a way to, 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 to evaluate a, uh, the value of a human life, measure the value of a human life, like really. It's, it's, it's kind of what it is, right? When you, when you get, if you're a high net worth person, you can get more life insurance, right? If you're a lower net worth person with lower credit, you get low, you can't get as much life insurance, really. If you have more responsibility, you can have more life insurance. If you're the founder and you have a bunch of employees, you can have life insurance on all those people. So if you think about it very holistically, life insurance is a way to leverage, evaluate, liquidate the economics of a human life. In a lot of ways. So then when you tokenize the life insurance contract, what are you really doing? Right? You're tokenizing a human life. You're using life insurance as a non-fungible token. There's nothing more non-fungible than a human life. You turn it into an NFT and then you further fractionalize that through a security token in the daylight of the SEC and the regulators. 
And now you're really not tokenizing life insurance. You're tokenizing a the value of a human life. And if you think of it, if you did this fundamentally, and that's why I wrote this book, Child Millionaire, years ago, was because I saw the economic value of adding, putting money into a child's life at 15 days old, you can start to pile money into and increase the, the, the value of that, that life, right? And now you have the ability to further tokenize that value and democratize that, that, that value, right? You think about generationally, if, if, if what, what starts to happen, it's very, very powerful. This is a solution to consumer debt. This is a solution to the uncertainty and the fears that people have around money. If this becomes the new norm, and this is, this is historically, I mean, this strategy here has existed in North America. Child, child life insurance has existed. It's amazing how many people don't buy into it because they, they, they get stuck on, oh my God, if I put life insurance on my child, I'm acknowledging their death. How right. stupid is that? Like you're, you're, unfortunately, your child's dying at some point in time. Like we know this, but this is human beings. We won't come to this like fundamental idea that a human life has scarcity tied to it. It just does, right? But if you're leveraging that, and if you think about even what Satoshi said in his white paper, right, about the, the, the true elements of blockchain technology use case is peer to peer. Well, last time I looked, peer to peer meant human to human. Well, if you're valuating a human life, peer to peer, pooling it and using blockchain and then tokenizing it, seems like a pretty darn good use case, right? Seems like we have a responsibility to buy into this. So anyways, I'm on my soapbox right now. But No, that's... Man, that was super powerful. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Good. Love that. Yeah. I usually save that. I save that for a slight. I, you know what's interesting? <laughs> I used to do that two years ago. And even my team would look at me like I was nuts. But even over like the last two years doing that, it's interesting how I do that. And Bob has heard me do that for two years. People get it. Now, two years ago, they thought, okay, you got to leave. You're weird. Now people get it. I couldn't say two years ago, tokenizing a human life. Because yeah. that's what it is that we're doing. Yeah. It, it, and we're just, the, life insurance is just the, the thing that allows it to happen. Yeah. Um, but today we can say it, just even your response, Travis, very interesting that, you, that you're, you're picking that up. People like you two years ago were like, no, you got to get off. This show will never come to air because of what you just said, <laughs> you flake. <laughs> No, I'm thinking about putting this on the intro, man. This is that, that was like, I had, I had literally a goosebumps when you, that was good. No. Do with it what you will, brother. Amen. Amen. I yeah. love that. Amen. <laughs> so as we're closing out, you know, why don't we do uh, some final remarks? I know, Bob, what I you know, following up to, to Cole's uh, message is, is maybe kind of hard for either one of us, but I'm going to let you go. <laughs> well, just to elaborate on what he's saying there to amplify it, like it really is an economist, especially coming out of, he mentioned in the beginning, I, I'm a member of what's called the Austrian school. And one of the big things in their history was the critique of socialism. And the problem there was, you know, the, this guy Ludwig von Mises was the economist that pointed this out saying under socialism, they don't have market prices for the means of production. Whereas under capitalism, you do. And that's why, you know, capitalism works. The entrepreneurs, they, they know the cost of what they're putting in. So here, yeah, we're in a sense giving market prices for human capital. That's one way of thinking of it. And so as an economist, like when, when Cole pointed out, I was like, yeah, that is kind of what we're doing. So I'm excited just like, besides, I think our company's great and we're, you know, going to reward our shareholders and help our direct customers. I think just what we're doing in other firms that, you know, copy awesome and do similar things like we're just revolutionizing just the the global economy and we're just we're we're filling in gaps in financial markets that thus far like don't even realize was a gap so i i think we're just even now just scratching the surface of how much this transformation is going to change things absolutely cool i'll leave it at that i think i okay. I, I burned all my uh my <laughs> my energy on that last uh monologue so no, that was great. Yeah. No, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. I mean, yeah. this is this is a great chat. And uh, yeah, Infinio is going places. The future of finance is bright. And the things that you uh, you know know least about or, or seem least obvious to transform the world sometimes are right in front of your face. And you know, they are in fact you and, and the human capital. So I, I, I like where this conversation uh, started and ended and, and excited to, to continue to Keep up with your, your success and, and everything you guys are doing. 
So thank Great you, Bob. Job, thank you, Cole. Keep going, man. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Travis. Thank you. Take care. Too. Cheers. Bye.